And then um, you can also have one that like runs at the end of the test to clean up after itself. I haven't done it in this test, but um, you can also have, before each individual test runs, you can have uh, like a setup that, that goes and prepares something and uh, clears it afterwards. So um, if I have my init, this basically makes sure that there's always an application uh, present, user's application. And then I've got these three tests, uh, two tests here. Um, I thought I had three up there. Um, and that all the test needs to do is just write some simple QGIS code. And then you get some special QGIS, uh, Qt macros that will allow you to test the state uh, or, or to report the state of the test. So um, I just normally use QVerify, which is like a cert in Python. So you just say QVerify that something is an, an expression inside which can be true or false. If it's false, then the test fails and then uh, we we'll get a report. If it's true, then the test passes. At the end of every test um, class, you have this, these two lines of, uh, it's also magic, here. Uh, basically, you say that this uh, uh, Qtest main macro declares what the name of your test is. And then you have to include this um, meta object compiled uh, resource, which is generated by, um, by CMake. Uh, or by Qt, uh, uh, the mock program of Qt. It generates this based on the contents of the test, and this adds all the, the scaffolding, all the internal stuff that the test needs to run. So if you write a simple test like that, then the next thing you need to do, um, I should learn Banner's keyboard, yeah. is um, you need to add it to the CMake list. And we've made it really easy in the CMake this file, so we've got a macro, um, uh, whatever you call it, like a little function that you use, so you don't need to edit anything at the top. All you need to do is, uh, let me just find it down the bottom, you just add a line at the bottom here. And the, add, uh, the line basically gives the name of the class which contains a test and the symbolic name of the, um, of the test. And then it will be added to the test suite, it will be compiled, it will be, uh, next time you run the make test, it will be run. Um, sometimes you may need to add something like add initial uh, library dependency. The same library dependencies or library linkages used for every single test in, in this file. So if you want something a little bit different, like you want to link one test only to a certain library, something you might have to uh, to, to change this, but for most cases, you can just take one of these lines, copy <coughs> it with the n n name of your new test class, and then that's all you need to do. And then when you want to actually run your tests, um, when you compile them, they actually each one gets compiled as an art, as a executable. Um, ah. So, so you can see all the tests are um, there, point test, wrestler test, each one gets compiled as an executable, which you can run on its own. I'm not sure if it will run. Yeah, um. Shift 7. Thank you. <laughs> um. <laughs> uh, oh, okay. Um. So you can run it, it's just an application that you can run on the command line. Uh, and it will put all the uh, debug and whatever output you like onto the command line. And it will report fail or pass for things that didn't uh, work. That's the first way you can run it, just run the individual programs. But you can also use a test runner <coughs> to run it. So you can say ctest, like that. And then it will, all the tests that you registered with, within uh, that CMake this file, it will run them sequentially and make a summary for you of everything that passed. Werner's computer is in a good, in a good state, so he passes everything. And you get a summary at the bottom. And this ctest program has got a lot of options that you can give as well. So I can say, for example, I want to run only one specific test, and I don't want to go all the way into the bin directory. I can just do minus R, and then 
like that and then it will do a regex match for tests that have got the word renderers in and then just run that one for you. So that's ctest um, you can use, um, then you can also, there's a make rule, just to make it easier, make check, or you can say make test, it'll do exactly the same, it's just running ctest on its own. And then, um, the real magic from this weekend has been, you can also now run make experimental. And if you run your test like this, then it will, it will run and it will get submitted to the, um, to the dashboard, which I'm going to show you now. Um, so this basically, it's a, it's a test runner that also submits it in a, to a, a common repository of test results so that you can compare all different uh, users' uh, test outputs. <coughs> And th there's, a, there's a lot of extra things you can do, like you can submit specific information or extra files with it. Use it, uh, like you can, you can script everything, so it's quite open-ended. Uh, let me just show where it's going to. Do you have a browser? Up us. What? It's Debian, it's Debian. It's Debian. It's Debian. Yeah. Uh, well. Isn't it called dashboard? Yeah, I was hoping it would just sort of, sort of search in your ice weasels thing. So if you, um, let's see if it finished. Okay. <coughs> if you, um, if you built your test, if you've run your test using Make Experimental, then it will get submitted to this dashboard. Um, and the dashboard shows you your host name, or you, if you want to, you can go and configure some <coughs> settings in CTest to give it some some specific name. Like I want it to be fancy, so I put my my name in front of it, and um, and then it gives you a report showing you um, basically when when a test uh, make experimental runs, it does a, a C make, and then it does a make, and then it does a C test, and then it does a submit. And it shows you which whether each of those steps succeeded or failed. And um, if something's failed, um, which passed before, so for example, this one had the, the if we go down and look at Stingray, um, the last time he ran, he had 23 build errors. And now he's run and he's got one build error, so it shows a very small minus 22 next to it, showing that he's improved, he's now only got one build error. Um, and everything that it shows you is like all the diagnostic information for the, the person's computer. So, oh, there's got some funny thing going on with this Q option. So we, I know this guy having a compilation problem with Q, just <coughs> options dialog. And um, the test himself, you can look at, like that one failed, so you can go down and look at the list of all the tests. So I can look at the history of all running of this test for this, I think it's for all users here. So I can see, oh, it's not only this guy who's having a problem with this test, but actually a lot of people have a problem with this test. Um, but also a lot of people are passing it. And it shows me a lot of information like how long the test takes on average. I'm just keeping all the statistics for you. And... Um, The other thing you can do with the test, um, I'll show you a quick example, is when you run your test, if you want to um, send some image to the server, you can send an image or some text string or um, uh, there's various other MIME types supported. And you can submit it to the server and it will display it on the page. So in this case, uh, this test is comparing the render output, uh, what actually got rendered, to a control image. And then... Uh, you can see there's some small differences between the two and, and that all gets submitted to the server so that somebody reviewing the dashboard can actually see um, what's going on. Maybe his airplanes are also not drawing nicely. And then, um, so you see all the problems that they might have had. And then here I've, I've submitted some um, extra information like um, I've, I've calculated the MD5 hash on the images and compared hashes and things. So you can submit all this information that somebody can then look at 
and understand why it's failing on your system. Uh, and you get a lot of other kind of reporting like, like this, or like this. Yeah. Oh. So we don't have, we've only set this up this weekend, but over time you'll start to see trends and uh, all sorts of other useful information. Uh, so the test framework, we're busy getting uh, the test to run on all machines as best as we can, but I really want to encourage you, I mean, we've got all the infrastructure now. It's, we've, uh, we've also got, I uh, should show you, um, uh, this is taking a long time. Uh, if you look in uh, coding, the coding document, which you should, or you should all be familiar with, um, there's a section on writing tests. Yeah, so unit testing, section number three. And it explains everything that I've shown you now, except for the dash thing, which we've only done now this weekend. So. Um, Uh, so, um, and it goes into a lot more detail showing you what's, what you need to do and uh, uh, what the procedure is and everything. Um, so you, if you want to write your first test, you could come along here. Actually, the easiest is just to take an existing, find the simplest existing test that's close to what you want to do and just copy and paste it and change the names and uh, start implementing your, your test. So. Uh, uh, and, and if you want to understand more about this, the testing framework you, beyond this, you can go to um, Qt Assistant. It's got a whole section. Do uh, you have it installed there? Yeah, yeah. I mean, it's just, yeah. Uh, so, utilities and testing. Um, so if you read in the Qt test lib, they tell you all about uh, what you can do with Qt test and you can do advanced things like data driven testing. So you can have, for example, uh, a data structure or a database with a whole lot of different permutations and then run them repeatedly doing the same function but with different data every time. And um, you can do GUI automation testing like clicking on widgets and then looking at the state of widgets and simulating mouse clicks simulating keyboard uh, input and uh, looking at the state of widgets and then making your test pass or fail based on the state. Um, so they have a lot of information there. And then you can also go to CMake, uh, uh, CTest documentation. And th they have got a lot of information on, this is the, the, the test running framework, and um, they've got a lot of explanations on what you can do. So there's a whole lot of features like you can do automatic testers, at nightly builds, and all kinds of things like that. So I want to encourage everybody to like make a lot of tests, and uh, when you find bugs, don't just fix the bugs, write the tests so that you can see that the bug doesn't come back again. And if you make new features, where it's feasible, the right tests to go with them, especially if they're in core. Um, because um, <coughs> it takes a bit longer to write the feature, but um, it will save us all a lot of time in the long run. Can you pour your nuts more quietly or some <laughs> <laughs> Any questions? Any? <coughs> Next next month, uh, uh, next Hackfest, I'll like maybe prepare actually like a workshop where we can write one from scratch and uh, if people want it and uh, really try to make it easy to, to get started. Uh, question. The yeah. first step uh, probably is uh, to complete the test case for uh, the core. That's the idea, part. yeah. So we're just focusing on the core library. <laughs> and what, I, what I'm going to do as well is um, <coughs> the next thing I'm going to do is work on a Python test suite for the Python bindings mm -hmm. that you can run in the same environment so that we can, because 90% of people are probably just using the Python API. <coughs> yeah. So if we can have tests against that, it's testing both QGIS and it's testing what our end 
user programmers are, are using. But for now, we're just trying to focus on, there's one GUI test, but it's just a prototype, just to see that we can do it. But what we'd really like is uh, to get very good coverage of all the providers and uh, um, geometry classes and uh, all these base level things. There's uh, also... Uh, yeah, yeah. Uh, do you think uh, completing uh, For sure, for sure. But this is something that's really, yeah. I mean, you have to write the in because otherwise, for developers, it's just. It's boring. I mean, yeah. it's, actually, it's actually quite fun writing them, but it's you need to have just yeah. like nothing else to do because. <laughs> <laughs> that's right. Yeah. That's why I'm uh, yeah. If uh, some conscious user uh, would like to find a space that we. Yeah. Yeah. So I would suggest you to, to just put a, I know there we can an estimate of. Yeah. Yeah. Could do, yeah. um, and maybe a nice thing for a Google summer, I mean it's probably not cutting edge computer science, but, but it could be an interesting Google summer code project to, to build a good test framework for futures. Uh, yeah. Uh, uh, I know of other projects who made the mandatory for each action mm -hmm. to have the unit test. The word mandatory and QGIS just are like um, water and <coughs> oil, they don't really mix together. I mean, we can say something is mandatory, but usually like, I mean, we've said before, please, if you write core functions, make a test, but if somebody brings us something really nice and they don't want to mark a test, are we going to say no to them? I mean, it's, it's difficult. So. If we could, if we could, I think we would, but uh, if at least people get familiar with the test framework and actually see that writing a test for a new um, functionality is not so hard because the hard part is getting the framework in place, which we have now. <laughs> so now if you write something like, if I, if I write something new for um, uh, um, if I write something new for, for example, raster class, a uh, raster layer, um, test um, source for what I do is I just open this one here and say I've added a new function for the rest of the layer. And what I need to do is, is just add one line to here, like a, a new entry here, check something or do something. And then I write one little method here. Um, so actually you can see like when I, when I updated the stats the last time, I wrote this check stats function. and. Uh, uh, hash, 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 no hash, <coughs> shift seven, no? Okay. I'll the hash? Uh, the old fashioned way, I'll do the old fashioned way. <laughs> I'm right, I'm right. Yeah, so that's all I had to do was I just um, I had to write some lines and all I did was I, there's already a, a layer <coughs> loaded in the, in the um, fixtures that initiates the test. So I already have a raster layer available to do my test with, and I can just check that, well, is it as wide as I think it is? Is it as high as it is? What are the band stats that I get for it? Each one's just wrapped inside a queue verify, and then I put something, you can, there's a reporting system as well that you can just put something out into. You don't need to be this slow. So your test could even just have one line here. If you just say queue verify, this equals that, and that's finished. Anyway, if anybody wants to try and wants some help, I'm happy to help you to write your first tests. And maybe you are in some hackfest, we can have like a test sprint day where we just all agree to sit and write some tests for the day or something like that. It would be quite fun. No more questions? The other thing that we, we were discussing on the list is if you're getting a contract to work on QGIS, it would be nice to just build in like testing as part of the thing if a client will be willing to pay for it. Sometimes there will be that. Um, 
to say, oh, I'll do the work like the mm -hmm. Oracle provider, and then I'll also write some tests for it. That's probably nice for the client. They know that they've got a testable implementation. Thank you.